All right. Uh, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about capacity building along with uh, my colleague Pamu. Um, so he's going to present a bit on uh, Sri Lanka um, and I will talk about some, some principles overall. Um, so I'm just going to refer back to our, our tracker house that we kind of initially started some of our discussions with to see some of the core areas where capacity building is involved. Now, you know, you could make the argument that many of these other areas uh, might also be impacted, but we're just kind of going to talk about some of the key pillars and how we might make some considerations around these, uh, you know, when you're making a training plan. So as I mentioned, um, you know, uh, I will be presenting along with Pamela. So I will present kind of an overview just of some of the kind of common adult learning principles that I think um, are, are relevant in this context. In particular, um, I'm going to try and relate them to various tracker implementations or various tracker concepts. Um, then we'll get Pamela to present on some uh, use cases from Sri Lanka in terms of the, the training he's performed. And then we'll just wrap up the session with uh, some information on the, the DHIS2 Academy program, in particular, um, some of the modifications we're making to the tracker configuration curriculums that are available. All right, so before we get started um, and jump into the kind of core of the presentation, um, I have a number of questions that I'll be asking you um, as we go through this presentation. Um, so if you can go to the Mentimeter, which you should all be familiar with at this point um, and use this code um, in order to answer this question, I just want you to list, each of you will be asked to list three qualities um, of your ideal trainer. So, you know, um, you know, what do you think your ideal trainer should have in terms of, of you know, their various qualities when you're when you're kind of working with them in the group. So I'll just bring it up here and you'll see the, the code here as well. Okay. So you can log in on your mobile or use uh, use the web, whatever your preference is. Um, and we'll just respond to that so when we see some of these responses come in. So as this is coming in, you can, you can already start to see some, some similarities between the responses. Knowledgeable is a particular one um, that you'll see repeated. Patience as well. I like the understand participants. I think that's important. So I wanted to touch upon a couple of these as they're coming in. So, so there are a couple of key things that I think are important when we're, when we're doing training that, you know, sometimes um, we do kind of tend to forget a little bit. Um, Kim mentioned understanding participants, and I think that that is kind of a, a, kind of a critical one um, in terms of being empathetic to their needs. I think many of us forget as we become more and more fluent with various tools and concepts, what it's like when you're first starting out to learn something. And being empathetic to those types of needs um, can be a bit challenging. You know, the farther and farther we get down the track in terms of our expertise regarding a particular subject, if you are particularly knowledgeable that emerging as a key concept, you know, the harder it is to kind of make things kind of uh, simpler in a way that, that, that people will understand. We, we want to have a bit of a bias in terms of how we present things in terms of a, a kind of a more advanced way that might be difficult or challenging for those um, who are just getting started. Um, I think another, you know, in terms of being knowledgeable, I think that's also, you know, a very good one. Um, you know, you want the person to be, uh, uh, you know, quite knowledgeable in the subject. I think it is important to also understand when you're doing training. You might have members of your team, however, um, 
that may not be as knowledgeable in the subject area, but do have a lot to contribute um, in terms of formulating training concepts and helping you um, kind of conduct the training as well. So there are some relatable skills because um, someone being knowledgeable about a particular subject and, and someone being able to kind of adequately then share the knowledge of that subject with others, this, these can often be um, um, you know, difficult, uh, different skills um, that we kind of see as we come in. Um, you know, regarding various concepts, but, but I think that these are all overall all great and, um, you know, preparedness is another one. I'll talk about that as we go through the session, good communication. You know, these are all quite relevant in terms of, you know, what we would think. So I think we have already some agreement here um, in general with the type of trainer that we're kind of considering, you know, when we're working with capacity building. Right. Okay. so I'll head back to the presentation. So those results will continue to come in and, and we'll make a recording and I'll, I'll share those with everybody at the end, okay? All right, so I kind of uh, wanted just to touch on this a little bit. When we're working with capacity building, actually there's there's two separate areas that we are, uh, that, that are actually part of this framework. And we often focus on kind of the left side of this diagram first, right? Even I kind of led, misled you in the way to kind of say, well, what is your ideal trainer? When we're dealing with capacity building, there's both learning solutions, and these are you know, various training solutions that we might discuss. And then we also have the secondary part, and this is often um, ignored um, this is when, we, um, when we're looking at performance solutions. And this is really looking at you know, how we evaluate those who, who we work with, um, hiring practices. So if you have a budget that you're putting together and you're able to make considerations around you know, various um, partnerships that you're making perhaps, technical assistance that you're bringing in, or even your own internal staff, um, in terms of looking at their own roles and reviewing that and ensuring that you're getting the right person to fit um, that particular role that you, that you are kind of, you know, foreseeing would have some impact for the longer term in the future. Now, for the sake of time and, and kind of uh, to just to ease this session a little bit, we're going to focus on, on learning solutions. But I have posted, um, uh, or I will upload to the, the Google Drive, some more information on performance solutions because I think it is something that um, is ignored a little bit in terms of you know when we when we think of capacity building we kind of automatically jump to training in a lot of cases right um, and, and that's even you know the way that things are posed uh, you might get a request for example that you know I need training on subject A right and is that really the solution that's going to lead to the best outcome right we often don't think about this in such a way that uh, you know we go through the process and kind of try to understand better what will lead to a successful outcome when you're doing this type of, of kind of uh, knowledge building or, or whatever it is that you're trying to achieve, right? So I'll make sure to post some, some more resources on this so you can get a better overview of what this represents and the different types of uh, performance solutions, the performance assessments um, that can be performed in relation to capacity building, all right? So I just wanted to introduce that as a concept, um, but for the sake of time, um, we will focus mostly on learning solutions, but just to make you aware that there is a second part of this um, that you know, should be considered as well. All right, so we're gonna go through a scenario um, as we kind of define this a little bit. And, and basically our scenario is looking at a tracker program, right? So in our scenario, we're implementing a tracker program for COVID-19 vaccination. An initial training was performed where a training of trainers approach was used. This was cascaded down to your district and facility staff, right? So you performed training at the national level for the teams, the national team went around or, or did this online perhaps, however it was uh, necessary and, and tried to train the, the district and facility staff. Now you are now noticing that several districts are struggling to report their data. Um, so, so what would you do? You know, um, We're gonna talk about some approaches that you could potentially take um, when you're kind of going through this, all right? So I wanted to introduce a bit of a model that we use in, in learning practice. And this is a very common model that's been around for some time. There are some issues with the model, but it's a good kind of framework for us to understand the needs of our, our learners and kind of you know, deal with how we're going to kind of respond to the various requests that we receive. Um, so this model is called the, the ADI model. It's just the acronym of what we see here, standing for analysis, design, development, implementation, and evaluation. So if we can, we can run through these steps and I'm going to explain each of these steps, but it doesn't need to be a large 
process in the sense that, you know, if you're kind of well steeped in the, in the needs of your own implementation, then a lot of this will come out naturally um, without you having to go through, a, you know, a very detailed process. Of course, I will discuss um, some of the detailed process if it is a, a very new task that you're considering. Um, but, you know, it doesn't have to be a long drawn out process in order to go through this, right? Um, so we're going to touch on each of these topics and kind of relate them to, uh, in particular, you know, how we would kind of work with something in our, in our scenario that we presented earlier, right? All right, so the first part of this is looking at the analysis. And what we're trying to do is assess learners' needs. So we have, a, if, we're, if we're doing some type of training, or maybe if, even if we're doing some type of performance analysis where we're trying to make some job modifications, et cetera, okay, what we have is our desired results, right? There's, there's somewhere where we want to end up, right? And we have our, our current results. So this is where the group is now as, as you're assessing them. And then we have to kind of assess, well, what do we need to do to take people from where they are now to where they want to be, right? And when we're looking at this, we need to be a little bit realistic, right? With our expectations. So in some cases, we have to be a bit careful, you know, regarding the pace of what it is that we're trying to achieve. So if we go too fast, we might lose people. And then the process to achieve these results, it'll break down a little bit, right? Um, but of course, if we can kind of separate this out in, in ways that, that make a little bit of sense, um, then we can hopefully get, get to our target area. So there are many different types of needs analysis you can perform um, to, to determine core problematic areas. Um, so I have actually posted this resource um, on the Google Drive folder, just so you can get a better understanding of what different types of, of needs analysis there are. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them at this point in time, um, but you can have a look at this resource just so you understand this a bit more. But once again, this does not need to be a drawn out process, right? The core of this is to understand the needs of your learners. And you might understand this already, right? In some cases, you might want to try and, and you know, if there is a particular bias leading you in some direction, then you might want to just have a quick discussion with some some of the individuals involved in your training to understand that a bit better. But you know, if you already have a, a general overview of some of the gaps that are present in your system because you're working in that system all the time already, then it's not something that you need to get into a lot of depth regarding you know, all these various concepts, right? Um, but the whole idea is just to identify the gaps that are present with the team that you're working with, right? Um, I've also posted, um, so for this academy, um, a couple of years ago, when we were coming up with it, we, we did perform a bit of a, a needs analysis on this. I posted that as well, um, so you can see what a, what a detailed uh, needs analysis would look like. Okay. So that, that will be available in the Google Drive if you want to, to have a look at that, okay? Okay, so the next part of our model was looking at the design. So this is the design of, of many different aspects um, of your course, all right? So going back to our example, um, as part of our reporting, we want to teach people how to use event reports, right? And we want to teach people in particular how to create line lists that include data from more than one program stage, all right? So uh, I'd like you to go back to the Mentimeter. Okay. And if we can answer this next question, right? So if you were to create a learning objective, for, you know, in terms of teaching people how to use event reports to create line lists that include data from more than one program stage. What would your learning objective be for in, in such a scenario? All right, so just give everyone a little bit of time um, to formulate their response, um, and, and then we'll discuss that a little bit more.
Okay, so we, we see some other responses coming in and uh, it can actually be a bit, bit difficult um, to develop uh, a learning objective, right? So we have some that are, are coming in that are, you know, a bit more specific and some that are, you know, a, a bit, bit vague, you know? Um, so, so when we're de developing learning objectives, actually specificity becomes um, quite important um, in terms of developing these. Um, I'll let the other responses come in um, as we continue this discussion. Okay. When we're looking at learning objectives, at least internal learning objectives, so this doesn't necessarily need to be shared um, with your larger audience, um, but um, we can actually break down learning objectives into three predominant areas, right? Um, this is called, uh, this is um, a, a very useful model in terms of developing specificity um, for the learning objective that we're working in with. And this actually becomes kind of a, a critical part in terms of defining, you know, how, how we're training and how we're measuring um, success, right? So that is the big thing. If we have kind of vague learning objectives, like, oh, um, by the end of the session, you will learn how to create event reports. Well, well what does that actually entail, right? What do you actually want them to do um, by the end of the session or want them to be able to achieve within that kind of, um, you know, session of working with event reports, right? So the three conditions are the condition. So um, what, what will they be provided with, okay? Or in what scenario are they going to be asked to perform this with? And you try and reflect a real, real world scenario as possible. So if they're not going to be uh, given any aid or they're going to be asked to do this from memory, um, then that needs to be kind of a focus in your session, right? Um, if, you're, if you're going to provide them with some type of manual or job aid or some other standard operating procedure, um, you know, then that's the kind of condition of, of them performing this, right? They will have something to refer to, right? The second part of this is the performance. What will they actually be expected to do? Right, so in this case, I put the learner will construct an event report line list of enrollment type. Okay. The third part is the criteria, and this is often the part that is gets a little bit muddled when we try to define our learning objectives. Right, we have to be clear in terms of what defines the success of that individual when they're you know when they're trying to meet the goals of this session. Right, so we have to be a bit specific here so we can measure or observe their progress against what it is that we're trying to show. Right. So in this case, I put to the extent that the event report includes parameters for the organization unit, period, and data from at least two program stages. And this might seem a bit involved in terms of, you know, um, when, we're, when we're thinking about what we're doing, but it, it gives us kind of very clear criterion in which we're going to measure their success against, right? So we don't necessarily have to perform a test or anything um, in order to, to kind of check how they're doing. We can just, you know, observe them and kind of see how far they've gotten. And if they're able to do what, what we've kind of uh, outlined, um, then, you know, we can mark this as a success. So this is much more for our own internal use. Um, so we can, you know, understand exactly where we want our learners to be. So this is a useful model to use before we actually go to develop our course material and before we actually go to deliver our training um, for our own internal purposes in particular. Like you might not want to present the learning objectives this way to the learner, right? This is maybe a bit too much detail, but for our own internal purposes to really understand um, what it is that we're trying to do, you know, it is quite helpful to, as a frame of reference, um, you know, for the subsequent portions of our um, material design and our, our kind of learning scenarios. When we create these learning objectives, there's actually many different models we use um, in order to define them correctly. Um, and there's this pyramid that I'm presenting to you that is a, a common model we use in order to kind of match what we're trying to achieve um, with ways that we can properly measure and, and kind of define what it is that we want the learner to do. Um, so at the top of this pyramid, we have the ability to create new things without basically much guidance, create, construct, design, assemble. These are the types of words we use to kind of describe this um, in a particular way. At the kind of bottom, we have just remembering, right? So if we just want to show somebody and we want be able, someone to be able to recall that from a, you know, be able to recall that concept, you know, that, that's kind of the most rudimentary level, but it's something that we build upon um, as we go through this. Um, so this model, you know, if I go back to my learning objective, you know, I highlighted that word construct, right? Because the idea is by the end of this, we want them to be able to create some of these on their own, right? We don't want them to provide a bunch of uh, handholding basically at the end of the session. And with that in mind, you might have to go through some of these other principles before you get there, right? You're going to have to really understand, you know, what event reports are. They're going to have to re remember all the different steps 
associated with, you know, selecting the data, the org unit, the period, um, you know, moving between the uh, event and enrollment type line list. So there's a, a bunch of different things that are associated with actually creating that report on their own, right? And, and, you know, we might have to work sequentially through some of this in order to reach that final kind of output or outcome that we're trying to achieve, right? So we sometimes use this in order to help us define our learning objectives and, and frame them in such a way that would be useful in the context of what, what it is that we're trying to do. Um, so when we're looking at the, the design phase as well, we're also trying to assess the delivery method, right? So how are we going to actually deliver this course? And that can, because that can affect, you know, when you go to actually create your material, that, that might affect then how we're actually going to actually, you know, word our material, how we're going to create our material, um, what that might look like in a little bit more detail. So on one side, we have kind of in-person training, job aids, manuals, things like that. And then on the other side, we have online solutions, right? And you know, due to the nature of the current situation, this is the direction that a lot of people have gone in, of course. There's a, there's a number of different ways, though, that we can deliver online training um, that can be useful, right? So right now we're having, we're having sessions, right? So we're here together as a group um, and, and we're all kind of gathered that way. But, you know, there can also be other methods that can be used depending on what's useful in this scenario that you're looking at, right? We can also have, you know, just basic online media content where, you know, you, you kind of assemble all your content together and share it with people. Um, there's also what we call online um, blended sessions, um, which are a mix of self-paced sessions, right? So you, you give them some material um, to look at, and then you meet together, you know, maybe one, uh, once every so often, um, and you go through the material you've discussed, right? So you're not spending that time together to look at conceptual material. You might go through some practical considerations and discuss what they've reviewed and see if there are kind of any kind of prevailing issues um, from the material that they re reviewed. Um, you can also do the same thing with this kind of online or in-person blended approach. So um, what, what I mean there is you would have um, a mix of online material. It could be self-paced or it could be sessional. And then you would come together as a group as well in person. And there, you know, there are just some things as, as you've probably noticed by now um, during this whole course, it's, it's sometimes difficult to convey certain concepts um, it, through an online format. And in that case, you might, uh, you might have um, some in-person sessions as well, right? So there are multiple ways to, to kind of deliver this online content. It's kind of up to you to assess um, what, what you think is most appropriate. Um, if this is like a huge refresher training for a number of health staff, for example, if you have a, a program on data entry, right? Um, then, then some of this might be helpful if it's kind of available as a refresher training, you know, on an ongoing basis. Versus if you're trying to introduce something new, um, like a COVID-19 vaccination uh, tracking system, you know, then you might have to come up with something new for that particular program. And you might want to be a bit more hands-on with the delivery of that, because this will be a new concept, both for yourself, as well as anyone being introduced to that concept, right? So it just kind of depends on the scale and scope of what you're trying to achieve and, and you know, how useful it is for that repetition as well. All right, so for, for online tools, I just kind of put a reference for you for some of the available online tools that are available to build certain types of course material. Um, we're familiar with, you know, we're using Zoom and Slack in this, uh, in this course. And then, you know, you're probably very familiar with some of these tools or also Microsoft Teams, which many of you might be familiar with as well. Um, in addition to this, we have what we call learning management systems. Um, we didn't use one for this course because we weren't really doing too much individual assessment. But if you are doing individual assessment, it can be quite useful, especially if you're delivering the course online um, and you want a method to be able to track your students' progress and share the various materials with them. Um, these types of things can be useful. I tried to highlight at least uh, one, Moodle, the first one, it's an open source system. So, you know, there's no payment associated with it. Um, so it's quite useful in that sense. Um, but there's some other ones that are also quite useful and quite nice um, for you to compare. Um, there's also a, a number of e-learning or authoring tools that we can use to develop our material. Um, I just put some references there for you so you can, you know, you can have a look at those um, when you get a chance. But there's a number of tools basically we can use to, to build our course if we choose to, you know. Um, it doesn't mean we have to go through this route. Um, they're, they're just there as kind of supplemental um, pieces of information if you are interested. Okay, so next question. Without referring to your notes, can you name all the 17 concepts associated with the tracker house? Yes or no? Okay. Just curious to see how our, how our attention has been. And be honest, it's not a, it's an anonymous uh, response.
Can you name them all, Shirji? No, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> That's intense. Okay, we're already seeing, you know, people are being honest with this. And, and that, that was my expectation um, about this. Oh, we have one person. That's great. Okay, so we can see that the, the majority of us, myself included, you know, um, are unable to do this, right? So when we're developing material, there is a concept about our memory retention, right? The longer time goes on, the less we remember things, right? So imagine if I were to ask you this question in a week, okay? You might remember some of those concepts now, but if you don't refer to your material, and in a week, I asked you the same question. You probably remember even less of that model, right? Um, so when we're, when we're kind of building course material, when we're developing you know, capacity building tools, it's important to provide people with enough context, enough information that they can find what they need and refer to it later on, right? So the whole idea is, of course, you know, in a real life context, you don't need to remember all those aspects of that, of that house. We have it as reference in, in multiple presentations, in our documentation. You know, so if you want to kind of gather and, or gain an understanding of that, um, then you're able to. But imagine if we just presented that house on a slide somewhere and we never shared it anywhere else, right? It'd be very difficult for people to then go back and refer to it or really remember all the different kind of points that are associated with it. So when we're doing training, we should think about things in the same way. We have to realize that, especially if we're not using a concept immediately, that the likelihood of someone remembering this is going to be quite low, right? Um, you know, especially if you're dealing with a complex process, right? You know, you're showing someone how to configure a bunch of components of a tracker program, or you're showing someone how to create a bunch of advanced reports and event reports, or, you know, you're showing someone how to, how to do some type of scheduling or, or some other process um, within your data entry. Whatever it is that you think might be a bit complex or new for somebody, um, whether or not they're going to use it immediately, or, you know, they're going to kind of use it, especially if they're going to use it, you know, maybe a week or two or more, from the point of when, when you're showing them this concept, right? Then we have to kind of consider, you know, what the memory retention is of that audience and, and how we can kind of mitigate this uh, a little bit um, as we continue going forward, right? So when we're looking to develop materials, there's kind of a simple timeline for training materials that, that we need to consider, right? So we have the before portion, and, and this can be minimal, right? You might want to provide a bit of uh, material beforehand. You might not, you know, it kind of depends on the training. If it's a completely new concept, you know, I, I would say it, you, we can be uh, careful here in terms of what we provide. Okay, then, then during, and this is where the largest focus is, right? You create a number of presentations, exercises, things of that nature for people to look at during the training. But then what happens after the training, right? And, and that is a, a component that we often do not spend enough time on. Right, where they're then not given enough material to review after the training is over. You know, in this case, we have um, you know the full implementation manual, both for Android and for Tracker. So we, there's a lot of reference for you to look at after training is over, on top of all the presentations and everything that have been included. But the whole idea is, if if that stuff isn't there, you know, then it's something we really have to consider. Um, you know, to make sure that we're able to meet the the needs of our learners adequately. And as I mentioned, distinct processes or tasks, tasks that have a lot of steps associated with them. So if we're showing someone how to maintain a tracker program, for example, and it's the first time they're being exposed to such a scenario, if you just do a demonstration of some kind and don't have any supplemental information for them after the fact, you know, they might struggle a bit to kind of remember, you know, all the different things that's uh, all the different things that they've been shown in relation to kind of doing that um, in their day to day job. And of course, if they're not going to be doing that for a little bit um, um, after, then the likelihood of them remembering you know, what you presented during those demonstrations is even less, right? So if possible, we try to take these kind of complex processes and break them down to those, their core steps. And we can use those core steps to serve as reminders um, for that process that you're showing, right? Um, this, is, this is a bit more challenging than you think, but, but the idea is, you know, the, the problem is you can make materials too long and people won't refer to them. You can make them too simple, and then it's not enough information for them to really retain or remember the concept that you're showing. So you have to find a kind of medium that kind of prompts people, 
prompts people's memory in particular to remember what it is that they've been shown with enough information um, that, you know, they can do the task that you've shown, but, you know, not too much detail that it's just going to become, you know, a huge document that no one will refer to because of it's so dense and, you know, people just don't want to read through it every time they're performing a particular task. Um, so secondly, if you're doing a, a training of trainers, right? So that was our scenario at the beginning, right? We did a cascading training of trainers, but now we're having trouble with people entering data in, uh, from the district, right? What are you providing to them when you're conducting the training, right? This is part of, I hope you're seeing that things tie together a bit in terms of understanding the needs of our learners, right? We sometimes make assumptions about what it is that people need to understand, and then we don't provide people with the correct information going forward. So do they need training on the subject? For example, if you're introducing that new tracker program, are these people who have worked with tracker for some time and can enter tracker data, but haven't performed a lot of training in the past? Or do they kind of need that full overview of how to enter that data, how to work with the information and within that program? And then also a discussion on, you know, how to actually deliver that material. I think one thing that is often, you know, unfortunately forgotten as part of this process is understanding of the program itself, right? So what I mean is, is you know, if you're dealing with a, in a health scenario, the, the, the kind of context, the public health context of that program and the different parameters that are associated with the workflow of that program. Now, that has been discussed in quite a bit of detail um, over the course of this academy, um, but the idea is to make sure we, we marry these two concepts. So if you're doing a TOT, you want to make sure you provide them with enough materials that if you're going to cascade this down, that they're given a package of sorts that allows them to conduct that training successfully, right? So some examples of additional guidance, they can be in the form of standard operating procedures, um, various manuals and job aids, step-by-step uh, -step guides, video demonstrations, for example. Um, but when we're making these types of things, we wanna make sure that we go over them as well. So if I'm introducing a standard operating procedure, for example, on conducting a training, um, then you know as part of your, your training, you actually wanna discuss the various steps that are associated with that, go through some mock-up scenarios with them in terms of you know, what that would entail when they go and actually conduct the training, right? We find this is often a bit rushed. And then, you know, um, unfortunately, later on down the track, you, you kind of see some problems emerge um, as they go to conduct the training later on, right? Okay. Um, we're, we're still um, in, in this developing stage and, and, you know, it can be a, a longer stage that the more prepared we are for this training, um, the, the better thing, the better your outcome will be, right? So um, a well-received model used in, in DHIS2 trainings, I think, uh, is, especially if we're trying to teach something practical, right? Um, this is something we follow in a lot of our, um, a lot of our practical academies and, you know, just a lot of our country trainings as well. Sorry, excuse me, Sherjit. I think I just lost sound. Does anyone else also lose sound? Oh, hello. Can you guys hear Thank me? You. Yes, you're back yeah. now. Thank you. Could you please okay. repeat uh, the last 15 seconds or so? Thank you. Yeah, sure, sure. Sorry about that. All right. So um, these first two steps, explanation and demonstration, um, they might be tied together a little bit. So if we go back to our specific example on showing people how to use event reports, you know, we might want to pull up a couple example event reports that have information from two stages. We might also want to show the program that we're working with, you know, hopefully before then you would have explained the program and, you know, all the individual program stages, for example, that make up that program. So people understand the context of where you're pulling that data from, right? So if I'm building a, an event report from two stages, people should understand the various data elements, et cetera that are within those two stages so they can pull the right data, right? So we're trying to build on previous concepts. It might also help you with your own kind of uh, sequential um, understanding of, of how you present things, right? Um, then we have uh, some practice sessions and um, depending on the complexity of the concept, you know, this is something we struggle with, I think a, a fair amount. Um, you know, one concept that I think has been coming up a lot lately is, is program rules. Um, we see this on the community of practice when we're doing trainings itself, 
you know, it's something we've continually struggled with in terms of how we get people to practice this correctly and, and how we kind of uh, deal with the transfer of knowledge. There's always changing rules and the context of those rules are different, right? So, so, so this is a scenario where we don't have a generalizable framework necessarily because everything is specific to a local context, right? Um, so, so there are areas I think that we struggle with um, even, as a, even as the DHIS2 team, right? And that we're trying to improve upon. Um, but in any case, as a, as a general model, you know, we, we kind of uh, perceive this as important, right? Then we have the, the evaluation phase. And I, I put test in brackets, but as I mentioned before, we don't necessarily have to test everybody, right? And we have to be careful, you know, a lot of people like this approach of, of testing. Um, but when you're introducing a new concept to somebody and, you know, particularly someone who's not that familiar with what it is that you're discussing, you know, testing someone that can be a little bit much in some cases, right? You don't want to um, you know, create some type of barrier to learning the topic, um, or you don't want to make it overwhelming for somebody as well. So you can do observational testing, right? You can have people present things back. You can just observe um, the steps they're performing to make sure that they're able to carry out the same models that you're doing. You could have ungraded guided exercises um, that, you know, allow them to follow the same steps that you're, you're showing for, for in order for them to achieve the final output. Um, so, the, so the evaluation doesn't have to be a graded evaluation in all cases, um, or like a, a formal test of some kind, right? It just you just need to be able to observe that they're able to achieve the, the final learning outcome, right? So, um, I've I've just linked a, a couple examples of uh, materials, um, you know, that can be used for reference. So, we have the implementation manuals on the documentation site for both Tracker and Android available. Um, I've just linked also some, some generic modifiable end user material for the, uh, the both end user and trainer, uh, trainer's guides for COVID-19 surveillance, vaccination and adverse events following immunization. Um, and, so, and, and also some specific videos that we made for, in this case, for Vanuatu for their rollout. Um, so just so you can get an, a sense of what's, uh, what's provided um, at various levels. Um, you know, so here we have kind of global scales, regional scales, and then kind of national scales as well. All right, and you can have a look at those whenever you get a moment if you think they're useful. All right, so we also have a framework for when we are developing our assessments, right? And if you remember these words here on the left side, they, they match that kind of uh, pyramid that I showed you at the beginning, right? So depending on the, the com uh, complexity of, the, of, it, of what it is that we're trying to convey, um, we have to select an appropriate method to evaluate them. Right. In the context of using DHIS2, some of these, you know, are not always relevant. So if we're trying to create something, right, like an essay or oral test could be replaced with, for example, an oral demo, you know, where, where we get someone to, to show us exactly what it is that, you know, we've asked them to do to make sure that their understanding of this concept is clear. Right. Um, so that could be the, the replacement of the oral test. Right. Or uh, an, an essay test could be just actually following along and doing some type of exercise. But we have to make sure, you know, in some cases, like if I were showing someone to create an event report and then I had a, um, I only had a multiple choice kind of quiz, right, at the end of the day for them to perform. I didn't have any practical exercises or anything like that for them to do. You know, that's not appropriate necessarily to, to guide or gauge their understanding, right? We have to make sure that they're able to actually achieve what it is that we're trying to do in a practical way, right? So we just want to make sure we're matching whatever it is um, that we're trying to show people with uh, appropriate assessment methods um, when we're kind of going down further down the track to making, uh, making sure people can perform the concepts um, that we're trying to teach. Okay. So this framework is more just to kind of reinforce that concept um, than, than to be a, a, some kind of a prescriptive uh, scenario, right? All right, so there's, there's different levels of, of learning assessments um, that we can kind of create as we're going through and, and performing our training program. So we have, uh, in some cases, the diagnostic or pre-assessments. Um, this can also be useful for our needs analysis uh, really quickly, just to understand what the strengths, weaknesses, uh, and knowledge uh, skills are of, of our learners prior to actually going through the topic, right? It also helps to develop the uh, a framework for kind of measuring success, right? You can measure before and after and kind of get a better idea of where they are. And we then have this secondary type of assessment it's called formative assessment. Um, this is used during the, the course of the learning activity. So this is just kind of chunking out your various topics and assessing them on one particular component. 
As part of that analysis training for Tracker, you might go over through creating um, various tables. You might also create some, some inputs using um, pivot table, for example, using program indicators, right? You might want to assess each of these components individually, right? Then we have a, the, the kind of final assessment, okay? And we call this a summative assessment. Um, basically, this is performed at the end of the activity, right? So this might be an exam of some kind. It might be a group exercise. You know, in our case, we're having you guys present back the project planning template for, as an example. It's not graded necessarily, but we hope it will provide you with some critical understanding of how to use that template going forward for your own implementation, right? So it's, it's always good to have something that kind of sums up the sum of their knowledge basically at the end. And once again, it doesn't have to be an exam or test or anything like that if we think about kind of traditional schooling, um, but it can be just uh, something that we can observe to ensure that people are able to grasp the concepts that we're, that we're showing them. So some practicalities on the DHIS2 side, right? When we're developing our material and training. So if we're doing some type of practical DHIS2 training, you will need at least one corresponding DHIS2 environment where you can conduct the training, right? Um, the environment should reflect the real, real world workflow of the program that you're introducing. So if you're introducing a new tracker program, right? It should, it should be the same, right? It should be identical. But this environment, you know, learners should be able to make mistakes without causing any problems to your production systems and data, right? So in a, a previous session, uh, I believe Marcus talked about various environments um, that you might have um, for long-term maintenance, like a development environment, for, for example, right? Um, you should also consider having some type of place for training, right? This doesn't have to be a dedicated instance for training necessarily, because it can be temporary or permanent depending on the frequency of your training. And in a pinch, you know, you can always take a backup of that development environment. And if it's clean enough, perform the training there. Okay, as well, and then just restore the development back up after the training is complete. But you just, I just want to kind of emphasize not to do training in your production instance, um, especially if you're dealing with some type of configuration topic, um, you know, that can lead to a lot of problems, I think, down the line, right? And in, in, in scenarios where you don't have data, for example, like you're rolling out a new program um, and you don't have data and you want to perform some, some uh, training on analysis, you know, then you might also need to make some extra considerations there. You know, do you populate the, the system with some type of data that you can actually use um, by just entering some cases or something like that, you know, and if that's possible, then that will kind of be more effective um, to your learning outcomes, of course. Okay, so next question. Um, I regularly test all of my training material before I present it during the training. Um, oh, sorry, there's an option three, but really it should be just yes or no. Did you test this before you presented it? Sure. I did. Yes. Except for the option three, apparently I forgot that. Option three, great. Okay, so that's good. It's mo most of you are are responding that you do you do perform some testing of your training material before it's actually presented. That's that's great to see. All right, so I just created a quick checklist um, summarizing some of the concepts we've discussed. So when you're actually going to conduct the training. Now, I know in reality, it doesn't work like this always, but the idea is to be, be as prepared as possible, right? So just summarizing what we've discussed, we have a clear understanding of the needs of our defined learning group. We have well-defined learning objectives. We have decided what it is that we're going to discuss. We have decided how we will deliver these topics, right? It's gonna be online, in person, et cetera. We've developed all the required materials and assessments for our, our learners to go through. And we have prepared or populated any of the required supplemental tools. This might be your DHIS2 instance. You've prepared all your Zoom meetings. You've, if you're using a learning management system, maybe you've uploaded all your content needed to support the delivery of that training material. And we have reviewed and tested the components for each of our topics. You know, at this point in time, you should be kind of well suited to deliver the training. Some of this happens in parallel, right? I know in reality, it's not always the case where everything is prepared and ready for you to deliver during the training, right? So you might be preparing things kind of 
in parallel to conducting the training, especially if it's the first run of that training, right? It often happens where, you know, just things happen, uh, other things happen and you're so busy. Um, and then you're kind of forced to develop things in parallel, right? You can still fo follow kind of similar steps um, despite this and think about it, you know, on a session by session basis, if that's the case, right? So if you don't have much time, right? And the, the practical considerations of this or implications of this are obviously that you can't go through all of these things, you know, at once. I mean, you would have at least, uh, you would have at least had some idea, you know, what, what the topic is, right? And, and, you know, hopefully by then as well, what's some of the material that might help you along with that. So if you are able to, you know, even if you're working late into the night before the training, which, you know, we've all, I think, done at some point in time, right? Um, you can still run through these concepts really quickly in your mind, just to ensure that you're able to kind of meet the criteria you need to make that session successful, uh, successful okay? Um, so it doesn't have to be a long drawn out process if you don't have the time. Um, of course, if you have a bit of time, it's better to be able to go through the, through these things uh, and assess them adequately. But you know, if you're not able to do so, um, you know, and, and you kind of are really crunched for time, just keep these things in the back of your mind um, because you know I knew I, I know that does happen, and, and we're all kind of uh, guilty of this uh, occurring in the real world, right? All right. So the last step is to kind of evaluate, right? So we talked about assessing, um, and this is different from evaluating, right? So when we're assessing, we're asking the learner to do something and observe them. And it, this is part of our evaluation, but there are other steps to evaluating, right? And, and I've identified kind of four levels um, of evaluation, right? Um, so the, the, the first level at the bottom here in red color is our reaction, right? And we've been asking you for this the whole training, right? We ask you for um, feedback every day. On, on all the sessions. We wanna to know to what degree you reacted favorably to the material we're presenting. You know, was it good, was it bad? Were there improvements we could make? Um, were there things that you appreciated more than others? You know, and this helps us to identify, you know, both within the training itself and for subsequent training, you know, what we could improve upon um, and what the learners, you know, kind of grasp upon. If there are aspects that they're kind of missing out on during the training, that's also something that needs to be addressed, right? The second level is this learning level. So to what degree did we kind of acquire the knowledge that we were trying to share with you, right? So we've created one quiz, we're creating another one for you to share with, uh, tomorrow. And we're also going to have a look at your project planning templates as well, right? So this is all part of this, this learning kind of framework that we're looking at. The last two are harder to assess and are often ignored a little bit, right? So this kind of is after the training. To what degree are, are participants able to apply what they learned when they're back on their job? And then the, the level four is the results. To what degree do targeted outcomes occur, right? So when I mean uh, targeted outcomes, we're looking at kind of overall organizational outcomes. So if you're implementing a tracker program, for example, you know, there are a number of outcomes associated with that. Obviously, you want the data to be of good quality. You want to be able to make, make sure you have all your cases entered. Um, you want to make sure that data is reviewed and used, that dashboards are created, right? This is looking more at organizational change. And there's often a it's often difficult to make a, uh, you know, a causal relationship between training and kind of this overall results phase. Um, but we'll just talk about this really quickly, right? So the first and second level, I think they're well understood. Um, you know, we, you gather some feedback on the training. You also assess your learners during the training. Here's an example of the third level and how we can kind of generate information on the fourth level, right? Um, so as part of that house, so I don't remember every part, but the very top was data use, okay? Um, as part of that house, right? So as part of data use, you know, data quality is always linked to that, right? So here's an example of, uh, I've modified this slightly, right? Um, for, for a behavioral kind of um, assessment on, on data quality, right? And there's a number of different items here um, that are available. And this would be kind of assessing them after you've done the training. So as an example, if we went through our training and uh, one component of that was data quality, um, you know, you might wanna see how their behavior changes um, when they go back to the regular job, right? And if it doesn't change, then what was the cause of that, right? So this is just a quick checklist and this is meant for, you know, someone else. It doesn't have to be a supervisor necessarily, it could be a colleague or peer, right? Um, and that can also be beneficial if you have a peer assessing your, uh, you know, assessing what you're doing. And it's not meant to be kind of positive or negative, you know, um, saying, oh, they're not doing this and therefore they should be punished. No, it's really meant to try and understand if the, if the training was successful, right? Are, are they doing some of these things now on a routine basis or, you know, have they just forgotten everything that was conducted during the course of the training, right? When you're going to look at kind of this more higher level organizational change, actually, a lot of what uh, Anna and Brian mentioned um, in their sessions 
uh, regarding evaluation is more pertinent, right? You could try and summarize the results from these type of behavioral evaluations to determine, you know, um, at a larger scale, was the training successful? But, but actually, you, you know, you, you'd probably be referring to more of your evaluation frameworks to understand this in a bit more detail. So you'd have a bit more evidence to kind of um, substantiate um, the link between um, the training and the, the kind of final outcome. All right, so um, I just wanted to present some of these concepts. Uh, you know, I went through that the entire model at the beginning here, right? Uh, just so you could get an overview of, of what some of this represents, right? Um, and, you know, there's various ways we can apply this to training. Um, and of course, uh, we can entertain some questions um, at the end of the session. Um, but I'd like to hand it over to Panmode um, so he can present a bit on what he's been doing in Sri Lanka. Right. Um, thank you very much, Rajit. Let me share my screen. All right, so uh, uh, in the previous session, we learned about uh, what are the different concepts of capacity building and what are the best practices that you can apply in, in, in a country setting. So let us see how we have uh, in Sri Lanka, we have tried to uh, apply different concepts and best practices of capacity building uh, with the given, uh, with the provided uh, limited number of, uh, limited amount of resources that were available uh, in this lower and middle income country. So uh, uh, for this presentation, I'll be mainly sticking into two uh, uh, tracker programs. One is the nutrition uh, use case, which I presented uh, to you last week. And the next one is the uh, COVID-19 tracker implementation, which also I discussed uh, in a previous day. Uh, so uh, I, I will not go into too much information about the background of these two programs, but I will uh, uh, only talk about the capacity building aspect of it. So a uh, few things that we have to keep in mind. Uh, now, uh, usually when we talk about capacity building, the first thing that strikes us is like, uh, it's about training. But uh, uh, in a larger context, uh, especially in a country context, it's not uh, only, I mean, it has a lot, lot other things to do uh, beyond the scope of training, right? Uh, it's a rather a long-term process. So uh, in this long, uh, in this uh, broader topic of capacity building, we may have short-term uh, activities like maybe conducting training programs or uh, providing material and resources. But then uh, in addition, there's a long-term part of it as well. And also when you talk about capacity building, you always have to think about uh, covering all the levels, right? Uh, it's not only about uh, uh, building capacity at national, it has to incorporate national, district and sub-district level, as well as the service delivery level. And also capacity has a lot to do with governance as well. So what I'm trying to highlight is uh, in a country context, there has to be some governance mechanisms, right? So if you have some uh, uh, go governing stakeholders like the Ministry of, Ministries of Health or maybe the, uh, the, the, the central government, you will have to merge with the initiatives that they are having. And also there has to be a proper advocacy uh, that happens, uh, that, that takes place uh, with the governing entities for us to build a capacity. So this is exactly what we try to do in Sri Lankan context. So um, uh, the major uh, factor that I would like to emphasize in Sri Lankan capacity building is this high level health informatics capacity building uh, initiative, which, uh, which, which started about a decade ago. So uh, what we have seen in this country context is that uh, mostly um, uh, uh, before start, I mean like, uh, we, we, we can be very ambitious in implementing um, the various informatics programs, but the main issue that happens is uh, the, the government stakeholders and uh, people who are placed at district and sub-district level who will be ultimately implementing these systems, they need a lot of capacity. I mean, the, uh, usually in country context, the people who are right now uh, holding these positions are mostly from administrative background or purely medical or health background. They will not have uh, the, uh, the sufficient knowledge on knowledge and uh, exposure on health informatics. So in this country, they took this as a major uh, major initiative. I mean, to build capacity uh, in health informatics. So what they did was they recruited uh, some medical doctors. I mean, these medical doctors were from kind of public health aspect. So what they did was they uh, had these medical doctors uh, trained 
on health informatics by providing them uh, uh, with a master's program, uh, which ran for like two years. And finally, after completing these master's programs, uh, they were absorbed back into the Ministry of Health and they were placed at national and district level to implement uh, information systems and also to build capacity at all levels. So for example, the national level uh, 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 health informatics program graduates, they'll be working mostly on the policy and uh, uh, the governing aspects of information systems, whereas like uh, people who will be mostly at the district and sub-districts level, they'll be uh, focusing on very specific information systems and building capacity. I mean, uh, capacity as in at end user, as well as ICT staff and other supporting staff capacity at all these levels. So this has been some, uh, so, I mean, this has been almost now uh, continuing for like 10 years. So with this, the country was able to build capacity at all levels so that uh, uh, in, a, in a short span of time, if, a, if the decision to implement the information system uh, is taken, they have the uh, relevant capacity up to the uh, community level so that they can quickly expand the system and roll out in a really fast manner. Right. And then the capacity, when you're talking about the capacity, I mentioned like there are multiple levels. So uh, one thing in, in Sri Lanka is that they have the local HISP, HISP uh, group. So basically his group uh, is well connected to the uh, global HISP network. So here we, we are talking about uh, uh, some resources who have uh, years of experience at local and international level. And also they are very well connected with the DHS2 community as well as University of Oslo, right? So uh, they, they even get regular exposure to uh, various training programs and capacity building activities that is conducted by University of Oslo. So these set of uh, experts are the, are the first group the country tries to contact in case uh, if they are trying to uh, start a new project possibly on DHIS2 or even uh, uh, a general health information system, uh, maybe on a different platform, because they have a significant uh, amount of uh, knowledge and expertise uh, on, on implementing systems. Uh, they are the first kind of uh, people that uh, uh, the Minister of Health tries to reach to. And in addition, uh, we, are, we can also talk about program level or as national HMIS level core team. So we need this um, now, why I mentioned it's not the national team, because like, for example, in Sri Lanka, we have multiple vertical programs like malaria program, TB program, who try to uh, uh, kind of uh, implement their system uh, in, a, in a vertical fashion. So they have the national team and they also have the district and the service delivery team uh, with their own staff who try to implement this system. So for this, of course, when you're talking, talking about this core team, it, it's a kind of a small team like you may have uh, 10 or less number of uh, people in this team, but uh, interestingly, they have to be from multiple competencies, right? So uh, we are not only talking about uh, people from ICT background, but you need to have some uh, domain expertise from health as well as health informatics. So this uh, mix of people will actually function as the, uh, as the core trainers of this uh, system. And also they'll be uh, involved in conducting training of trainers programs as well as material development. And this group are the ones who will be directly con connected with the district team who actually take uh, care of all the training programs and capacity building activities uh, uh, at, the, at the field or community level. So that is why this team has to, has to have kind of uh, uh, multiple expertise together uh, for them to have a successful implementation. And of course, the end user level, that's the next level. Uh, now, uh, when talking about Sri Lankan context, what we have uh, seen is like, uh, we, we really need to have a better engagement with the end users because uh, the, the thing is like, uh, you may have these field health workers. For example, on the previous day, I talked about this public health midwife who will be collecting data for multiple programs. Like it may be the nutrition program, the maternal program, or else even COVID-19 control program. So, what we have seen is when you try to kind of build core competencies in them, like for example, uh, if you try to build that, build ICT competence so that they can use a mobile device and maybe uh, uh, they know how to uh, join a Zoom call, right? This will really uh, uh, be helpful for not only for that, uh, say for example, nutrition program, not only for the nutrition program, but even if they want to introduce another program, this capacity is going to help. So we are uh, in. So because of this, we are talking about cross-sector capacity building. I mean, it's not a very hard thing to do, 
but it's just that sometimes we don't realize that, that how important it is to build these core competencies on ICT in addition to the very, very, very specific competencies we build on how to use the information system. And also the other thing, like uh, when we talk about the, uh, the end user level, you, uh, you talk about uh, kind of a, I mean, high turnover. So because of that, we may need to conduct a more refresher training program uh, more frequently compared to other levels that is uh, national and district level. Right, so before the pandemic, this is how we tried to conduct a training programs, especially on tractor-related tractor, uh, tractor programs. So uh, now our general understanding is uh, uh, conducting training programs on tractor is much difficult than uh, training people on how to use aggregate, right? So because of that, especially at uh, the, the lowest level, we try to have uh, multiple training programs with smaller or manageable size of uh, a, a group of participants. So it totally depends on how many facilitators or trainers are available. So uh, what you're seeing here is uh, one training program we have uh, we, we were conducting before the pandemic uh, for the nutrition program. So uh, the one full day training program that we planned contained uh, some knowledge building sessions like uh, these are the theory or like I mean some presentations, but uh, much of it uh, was for hands-on training and also uh, having some exercises and to let them use the, 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 the tool and to kind of get, uh, I mean, from them, we we try to uh, get the issues that they might, uh, they might encounter. And we try to uh, kind of have a better discussion amongst the participants so that um, um, we can get a bit, I mean, uh, all in all, it, it becomes a really fruitful training program. So this, uh, to do that, we had to have a manageable size of uh, participants and that was the main focus before the pandemic. But then again, things change. Um, the pandemic uh, came in like uh, it was it was from early 2020, but uh, we were kind of ready with uh, the level of capacity that we were building at uh, all the way up to the field level because uh, even before the pandemic we had this online um, um, uh, technologies like Zoom which was available to the sub district level. So during the pandemic, just like what we are doing here, we mostly shifted to the online training program. But then again, one major issue which we had uh, in getting field health workers is that like, how, I mean, what's the uh, uh, amount of knowledge and competence that is available for them to use these tools. So more, more often, uh, at least this, uh, I mean, at, at the level of uh, uh, the field level, we had to uh, get down these field health workers at, at the sub-district level. Uh, to conduct these training programs. In, in, I mean, um, not always, but in case if we detect that uh, in a particular village or like, a, uh, I mean, uh, some area that we don't have enough competencies or they don't have the necessary infrastructure to join these meetings online. But then uh, but then again, like this has been one method that we have been trying so, uh, so hard during the last 18 months. And uh, we have had kind of like moderate amount of success in conducting this uh, online training programs. And of course, uh, about user guides and user material. Now, the thing is, uh, like, uh, we, we can't just ask the end users to refer to the DHS2 main training uh, main user guide, right? It's too comprehensive. So what we try to do uh, in, in almost all our tracker programs is to have this kind of single page user document, which is very color colorful and concise. But uh, the major difference between this one and one we use for aggregate uh, programs is that for tracker programs, because multiple steps are involved, we may have to have a couple of documents, not just one single uh, uh, end user guide, but we may need to have multiple uh, end user guides, but this they can have next to their desk and use as a data entry companion. And of course, we are also using some training videos. Now what you're seeing here is the COVID-19 immunization tracker training video that we have designed and uploaded it into uh, the YouTube. So what we ask is in case if, if someone can't join the uh, online training program that we, uh, that we conduct, we just ask them to review this. And also in case, uh, I mean, at any time when they're entering data, if they encounter any issues at that point of time also, they can refer this uh, video, which is available online. Right. Uh, we also have a learning management system, uh, which is available uh, for a couple of health programs, especially the nutrition and the MCH program. Uh, we have this uh, system called eBridge, which is managed by the Family Health Bureau. So uh, this, uh, this is an example of a learning management system that Shurajit mentioned um, in his presentation. So we are using the free and open source Moodle platform, uh, 
Uh, and we have designed this learning management system, which has like not many at the moment, we have around uh, three programs uh, where the help the staff can enroll to the uh, all, already there with mean, the, the training programs which are already there and they can follow this structured training program. Now this program only difference uh, uh, with the previous uh, uh, slide which uh, where I showed the video is that here we have a structured training program where we talk uh, start from basics and um, we get them do some hands-on exercises, some activities. And also we have a, uh, towards the end, we have an exam so that uh, we can give, assess their competency and award a certificate. So this is, a, this is again, uh, something quite new for all of us. And uh, we are really excited to see how our participants and the uh, health staff is going to respond to this uh, new uh, learning management system. The next important thing is about uh, user support and engagement. So here, of course, like at like as any any training pro any any uh, tracker program, we need to have multiple levels of support available. So here we are we have devised a couple of methods. First thing is uh, the user guides, uh, like which I showed before, and uh, that day I mentioned to you about this peer support. So what we do is after training program, um, if if by any chance any participants encounter us an issue. We encourage them to directly, uh, uh, I mean, not, not to contact the national level uh, support staff directly, but to contact one of the peers, like, I mean, maybe a fellow uh, community health worker and try to see whether they can uh, solve that problem at that level. If not, they can put to the Viber group. So this instant messaging group that we have. And in that case, uh, these Viber groups are usually managed at the district level so that they can post in their local language and uh, even discuss the, uh, the issues that are uh, quite related to the region. And in case if this fails, we also have other solutions like the uh, uh, remote desktop and the mobile solutions, which are available in both the nutrition and uh, the COVID-19 surveillance program. And also the next thing is uh, the monthly conference. So here, of course, it's more about data use. So, uh, I mean, like uh, data use is one major component of capacity building. Because if the end user or the participants does not understand the value of uh, using this data or value of uh, engaging with this information system, the system is not going to sustain. So here we try uh, with, with this particular exercise that we have, we call it a monthly conference. So what we try to do is uh, in this nutrition program, where the uh, end users use a mobile device to collect data, they have a monthly conference where they where like say a group of uh, 20 community health workers uh, uh, they they kind of uh, join this program which uh, happens every month at uh, a public health doctors level so they are uh, they talk about various topics so what we have tried to do uh, in last uh, one to two years is that we have an agenda item where they discuss about uh, the issues encountered in uh, using this uh, nutrition program as well as like what insights they can get out of the data that is collected from their area. So they are, they are asked to make a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, just one person will present uh, per, per month. And also uh, the public health doctor will go through the data that has been collected. And there's a discussion uh, where, where he tries to promote uh, the use of data that has been collected at field level. And again, a uh, uh, kind of a uh, larger level discussion that we have is called reviews. So this review programs, uh, which has been even uh, even present uh, for like last, uh, I mean, like, uh, now th this new method of review, review programs, we started two years back, but uh, this is a concept that has been there for decades. So what usually happens is the national level staff, like uh, there's a group of around five people, they go to each district at least once a year and review the district level uh, data and have a discussion with the district level stakeholders. So these review programs uh, uh, is again another uh, concept to promote data use. So uh, here we talk about uh, different data quality issues, practical issues, and also how to, I mean, like we share the uh, knowledge that we have gathered from other districts with the, with the stakeholders. So here uh, now with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, this physical traveling has been really uh, restrained. So we, we, we don't have a team from national level, we don't go to uh, each of the districts physically. But nowadays we are conducting it online. Uh, so what happens is we, we, we select a particular district on a given day and we uh, ask them to log in um, uh, and get connected with Zoom platform. And uh, we have all the indicators that we are reviewing, which is available to national level as well as the district level in DHS2 dashboards. 
so uh, so the people who come to the session they know like what are the indicators that and and uh, what are the items that we are going to discuss and review in the program and um, with this of course we have been able to ensure the transparency and um, i mean previously these meetings have been like have even led to some conflicts saying like uh, the data that is interpreted by the national level is not the same data that the uh, field level has connected and things like that but with these online platforms and uh, especially with the dhs and the dashboards this review exercise has been uh, really easy to conduct. So these are a few insights that uh, I can share uh, from the experience that we have around uh, uh, the capacity building, data use, and review in Sri Lanka. Thank you.